Good morning, everyone. Thank you. It wasn't a call and response, but I, uh, I appreciate that. My name is Peter Greenberger, and I am publisher of The Hill. Welcome aboard for this morning's event, Innovation Runway, the Cutting Edge of Aviation. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsor, Delta Airlines, for underwriting this morning's program. Thank you so much for your partnership and for making this event possible. Aviation serves as a vital link in our country's transportation infrastructure. Airplanes and airports connect and bind our economy, our communities, and our people. As technological advancements continue to surface, the bustling U.S. aviation industry is poised to undergo major challenges. This change is likely to be met by a number of challenges, including the increased need for infrastructure funding and growing concerns related to maintaining customer and traveler safety. This morning, we'll be joined by thought leaders and policymakers from the administration, congressional decision makers, as well as a panel of people closely involved in all of these issues across the aviation space. But before we take flight, and yes, there will be a few more flying puns, a few quick housekeeping notes. In addition to the audience here in the room at the beautiful museum, we're also live streaming this on thehill.com and on the Hill's Facebook page. Please keep your phones on silent, or airplane mode, throughout the duration of the program. But we do encourage you to join the conversation. You can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Instagram. We're at The Hill Events. And you can join the conversation using the hashtag The Hill Aviation. We will be taking questions from the audience during select portions of the program. So please be aware we'll have some members of our staff with microphones. And finally, for those of you here in the room, you will be receiving an electronic survey after the event. We would love any feedback that you have. Our goal is to make these events better and better and more interactive and dynamic, and any sort of constructive help you can offer is appreciated. With that, let's get started. So it is my pleasure first to welcome Daniel Elwell, Deputy Administrator administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration, the agency tasked with the regulation of all aspects of the nation's civil aviation. Deputy Administrator Elwell was a commercial pilot for 16 years after retiring from military service as a command pilot with more than 6,000 hours of combined civilian and military flight time in the United States Air Force. He also served as acting FAA Administrator from January 2018 to August of this year. Mr. Elwell, it is a pleasure to have you with us this morning. Joining him on stage is my colleague, Steve Clemens, The Hill's editor-at-large. Hey Steve. everybody. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I, I, uh, I hope you're enjoying this smoothie. Dan, great to see you this morning. So let me just start out, because you're, you're a pilot. You, you know, as I have it in my cheat sheets here, you flew the DC-10, the MD-80, the B-757, and 767. Mm -hmm. So is it more fun being a pilot or being a co-pilot of the FAA? <laughs> Is that a serious question? <laughs> um, it's a good place to start. Good place to start. Um, there's, there's very little that is more fun than flying an airplane. Well, that, that's great. And I understand you're still checked out for a Cessna. Cessna citation. The, uh -huh. um, the FAA has a couple of them. And uh, when I came back to the FAA, uh, we thought it'd be a good idea to check out in that airplane. Um, uh, the deputy, you're the chief next-gen officer. Right. Uh, um, <clears throat> and... Uh, being able to fly in the system to see how next gen is progressing, um, we thought would be. Uh, I want to get into sense. the FAA next gen because I'm not sure many people uh, mm -hmm. in the audience and those watching online right now know what that is. Right. But I just spent some time on YouTube uh, mm -hmm. looking at the cartoon, um, you know, animated version, kind of telling us what the FAA next gen. Uh, program was all about and what it was doing, but why don't you give us a quick snapshot and then I'm going to ask you a really tough sure. question. Okay, so next gen is just sort of the catchword for all things um, in the uh, air traffic control system, hmm. uh, which encompasses communications. The, the pilots have to be able to communicate with the controllers. Navigation, you, ha you have to be able to navigate in clear air and in, and in uh, the weather. And surveillance, controllers have to be able to see uh, what's in the sky and what they're doing and be able to separate them. So mm -hmm. uh, 
CNS, we call it. And Next Gen is the modernization of CNS. And um, it's progressing to a satellite-driven um, system, data communication instead of analog and voice. Uh, so Next Gen is a suite of um, capabilities that we're maturing and they're getting, uh, doing, moving along quite well. ADSB is going to be the new form of radar or separation. Um, that's a new technology that becomes the law of the land mm. on January 1st of 2020. So it's the first um, seismic shift in, in uh, uh, air traffic control in 50 years. I mean, one of the things that, that got to me, and I highly recommend that, that people do go watch this YouTube video of, of, of the FAA explaining what Next Gen is, and it kind of goes through telling the story, essentially. It tells the story mm -hmm. of what a pilot would deal with and taking off and how technology can change flight paths and deal with weather. Right. But the first minute and a half were kind of scary because the narrator sort of tells the story of today, mm -hmm. that a pilot has to take stock of the weather, has to take mm -hmm. stock of other changes and then communicate back to the airline and communicate you know, back to the um, uh, air traffic control. And so the pilot is in this series of back and forth negotiations and then and and you know communications mm -hmm. uh, and then said well maybe the, by the time he gets through, he or she gets through all of that communication uh, things could have changed again and then you have to begin the process off and I guess I was kind of um, caught off guard that that's the way it is today mm. right I would have thought given communication that we would have already been that that we would have been in the next gen communication so what has held us back from modernizing more quickly than we apparently have because that narration kind of blew me away that 20 years ago we could have uh, mm -hmm. uh, had that kind of communication. Well, I have to confess, I'm not, I'm, I, don't, I don't know if I've seen the same uh -huh. YouTube video, uh, but what I can tell you, it's not quite that archaic, mm -hmm. particularly in the commercial passenger realm. Um, everything, uh, most of what a pilot does and a, a, an airline pilot does when he comes in and gets prepared for his flight has already been prepared and done for him by the airline's dispatch system mm. and it is dig digitally communicated to him. Um, the pilot is ultimately responsible for signing off the flight, that everything is in order, but it's, it's all in real time. I mean, we right. uh, pilots get um, weather radar in their cockpits and uh, so it's not quite as, as disjointed as it may appear. Um, well, I don't want to get the cartoonist or animator in trouble. No, no. Yeah, no. But, but it is interesting. Let me ask you another I know you've been putting a lot of time in the 737 MAX um, issue and what has happened, the grounding of the planes, uh, looking at the kind of broad question there. I, I went back to President Trump's tweet, and he said it was about the complexity of flying, and he said airplanes are becoming <clears throat> far too complex to fly. Pilots are no longer needed, but rather... Uh, we need scientists uh, from MIT. Mm -hmm. um, older and simpler are far better. Mm -hmm. Is he right? I think the president is articulating a point that we talk about all the time, mm -hmm. which is the interface between human and machine. And as a machine becomes more and more complicated, there is, by definition, less that the human is going to be able to... Um, deal with in real time in dealing with the machine. In other words, there's a lot going on uh, in today's modern technology below the line. Mm. And um, in aviation, what we grapple with all the time, human factors, the human in the loop, is the pilot uh, flies the airplane and the airplane can fly itself. And the pilot has to understand how to do both, how mm. to fly the airplane and how to manage the automation of the airplane. And, and this is what makes the job, I think, you know, um, very, very challenging and, and why we require 1,500 hours before a pilot can get into a commercial aircraft. Right. You not only have to be able to fly the plane manually and understand how to manipulate the automation, but then when either one goes awry, you've got to be able to know enough to come in and... And, uh, and fix the situation. So, you, know, I, you know, I'm a storyteller. I think people in, in journalism are storytellers, mm -hmm. and so we're constantly looking for heroes and villains. Who's the villain in the 737 story? Who screwed up? Because as best I can tell, a lot of people are kind of saying, oops, we had a problem, mm -hmm. but nobody jumping forward to saying mm -hmm. the responsibility was on us. And I'm sort of interested, as you were to sort of tell that story, who's the villain? Yeah. Um, in aviation, and in the forensics that we do for mishaps, it's interesting you use the word villain because we 
very, very carefully avoid blame because what happens eventually in any incident, we find out the cause, we find out the reason, and then we get better from what we find. But we uh, don't point fingers or assign mm. blame. We look at it forensically. And right now, that's what we're doing. I mean, there are two active accident investigations that are not yet complete. There are a number of investigations and audits being done on the process on the aircraft side of, mm. of these incidents, you know, the process of certification. Uh, what did we, how did we do it? What, what, if we missed anything, what did we miss? And in missing something, what do we do to never miss it again? And the same with the manufacturer. So um, uh, there's so much more information we have to gather before we can even begin to really ascribe uh, cause and effect, much less you know, villain. When you say the word villain, you, you automatically think of you know, sort of negligence or criminal intent. So that we're so far um, from the ability to be able to answer those questions, um, but we are getting very close to um, finishing the mitigation of the commonality between those two incidents. Today we're talking about innovation and, and sort of you know when I think of innovation and, and runways or airports. I mean most. I mean, I spent a lot of time traveling, and you know, it usually sucks. Um, uh, the airport experiences are awful. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't, I don't mean to put this all on your your, your desk, but you know, it's not fun. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, in the broad side, when you think about innovation coming on, you know, there are different ways to think about who you're innovating for. Are you mm -hmm. innovating for the pilots and the airlines? Are you innovating for the customer? Are you innovating for the packages that are flying on, you know, FDA, you know, Federal, yeah. Federal Express and UPS side? So. In the kind of broad array, when you look at your strategic dashboard of priorities that matter in innovation, what are the top top priorities mm -hmm. you think are important to move the needle, and, mm -hmm. and for whom? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> thankfully, the mission at FAA um, isn't about uh, customer service. I'm, I'm thankful. Most of my friends don't know that, though. So uh, the, the so phone, they, the they, phone calls they bring keep you coming. every yeah 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 yeah. So our our clear and the, the our the primacy of our focus is safety. So all innovation, everything we look at, and any change we make is geared towards the safety of passengers um, and the safety of of the aircraft. Um, that by definition, the provider of that service is interested in the innovation for customer. Mm -hmm. Uh, comfort, um, customer satisfaction. Um, sometimes the two will intersect. Um, if, if you know something an operator is doing that we don't for the customer that we don't th think is is safe enough, then you know we'll come in. But uh, but generally, you know everything we do, all of our innovations are for the safety of the flight, safety of passenger in the aircraft. When you kind of look at that terrain of safety and pilots and air traffic control. Are there things that we don't see day to day that we would be scared of that you see? <laughs> um, no, I don't. I don't think so. Um, you know, <clears throat> despite uh, uh, the tragedies of, of um, Lion Air and Ethiopian Air, um, aviation is still the safest mode of transportation on the planet, and and so we work day and night. FAA is amazing in its uni focus on on safety. We just had a fatality in Yuna, Alaska, Alaska, Saab, um, uh, carrying 38 passengers, one off the end of the runway, and unfortunately, a, a one passenger passed. Mm. That's the second passenger fatality in a U.S. commercial uh, passenger aircraft, the second fatality in 10 and a half years. And so in that time, we've flown over 90 million flights, and, and carriers have carried over 7 billion people. And when you think about that, um, uh, there's very, very little that goes on either in front of you or, or what you don't see um, that, would, that would cause you alarm. It's not easy. It, it's very, very um, uh, intense and careful work, but uh, it's, it's still the safest way to... So what's the deal with drones? I, I was reading one day that, that uh, London Heathrow... Uh, was entirely shut down because someone saw a drone in the sky, um, which, which I don't know, sounds like a dramatic mm -hmm. action to, to shut down a whole aircraft. You've now, I, we have got, a, I'm really looking forward to, to meeting him, a CEO of a company I think called Flirty, uh, which mm -hmm. is a, a um, uh, FAA-sanctioned 
uh, drone delivery service. I've just read, I was looking on the FAA Twitter uh, site and mm -hmm. saw that you uh, commended Walmart and, and some others for mm -hmm. uh, an experiment in, uh, uh, I think it was, uh, you know, a, a Virginia town. Yep. Um, and in that, and I know UPS has also been now licensed mm -hmm. to begin testing with drones in certain cities. So how are drones and a kind of new form of aerial transportation, if you will, and transportation mobility of things, at least, mm -hmm. if not people, uh, going to become part of your terrain? So <clears throat> they're very much a part of our terrain now. There's um, over... And should they have shut down London Heathrow for one I think it, I think it was Gatwick, and oh, they oh. did for a couple of well, hours. At least it was London. But yeah. they had more. Yeah. They had more um, than one. They were they were they were popping up a couple at a time and bringing them back down. They I couldn't see. find out where they were coming from. That was the issue. So there was a sabotage. Seemed like sabotage. Yeah, and it, and yeah. it was more disruption than mm -hmm. sabotage. There was never there was never an aircraft in any danger. But economically and for for um, efficiency, it just you know sort of ruined the day. Uh, and we're very very active with our um, agency partners at at DHS mm. and DOJ and DOD working at, if that were to happen here in the U.S., what would we do? But what we're doing with UAS, it is at the beginning of this na nascent industry, we're, we're kind of adopting a crawl, walk, run. Mm -hmm. So what you're talking about, the delivery, there's um, uh, Wal, I think it's Walgreens and, mm -hmm. and some other uh, local stores in the Blacksburg, Virginia area have already delivered merchandise to customers via drones. It's right. part of an uh, integration pilot program that Secretary Chow launched almost two years ago. Mm. Um, we have a year or, or so left in it. And there's nine different platforms, Flirty being one of them mm. out in Reno, delivering defibrillators in real right. time mm. uh, to, to folks who need them. Um, there's, uh, oh gosh, there's, there's, there's pipeline surveillance, there's um, law enforcement. San Diego is, is using drones uh, as a first responder for law enforcement. Um, and there's, there's, there's no limit to the things that drones can do. But <clears throat> we have to figure out how to make sure um, that when drones are in the airspace, they're able to steer clear of all other vehicles, including themselves, um, and that they are reliable enough that they won't fall from the sky mm -hmm. and do damage on the ground. Um, and that takes um, a lot of data, a lot of research. We have a remote ID rule that is uh, interagency review right now. Hopefully that'll be back before the end of December and we'll start writing a rule that will say if you're flying a drone under these parameters, you must be identifiable right. um, to other drones and to us, the FAA. Um, because once we're able to ID, we can tell good guy from bad guy and we can begin to overlay um, or, or integrate drones into the national airspace system so it, they can fly seamlessly. So would with you characterize aircraft. yourself as pro-drone? Absolutely. Very pro -drone. much You're so. excited by it. I can kind of get that. You mean The applications, think about firefighting, first responder. We used to call it at the beginning, I haven't heard this in a while, but it's dull, dirty, and dangerous. Mm. All of those things that are either very dull and expensive to put, um, you know, uh, man vehicles in, you can, you can use a drone all day long, mm. you know, to, to survey crops, to, to do pipelines. Um, the dangerous is obvious. Um, you know, every year in firefighting, uh, there's, there's, um, we, we have something happen to a manned uh, flight. They eventually will be able to do... Just, just two uh, fast questions, and I want to go to you um, yeah. in the audience, but, but one, um, is there anybody getting aviation better than us right now? Is the United States the leader, or are we lagging? And if there was somebody out there, whether in Europe or Asia, mm -hmm. um, that you see best practices coming on board that we could learn from, who would that mm -hmm. be? Which nation? Um, I, I think that it's not a competition. Mm -hmm. right? um, Damn. I think we are the, uh, the gold standard. Um, there, there are safety organizations around the world um, that are increasing in their um, capabilities by leaps and bounds, um, but modeled after, after our system. Um, we have amazing ingenuity and innovation in this country that, that is shared around the world. Um, we're an industry, aviation, holds nothing back when it comes to safety. So we, you know, our companies, airlines, right. nobody competes on safety. So, you know, there may be a company in Europe that, that comes up with some new innovation that, that 
appeals to regular safety, everybody's yeah. going to have it. So I hate to put it this way, but, but is it sort of a kumbaya world in a sense of sharing? Because I, I covered a lot of national security and intelligence work, mm. and even traditional allies that have worked with each other for scores of gener you know, uh, years are now beginning to become more hesitant in sharing. The frameworks mm. that we built mm. are coming apart. Is any of that affecting your interface internationally with others, or are you still in a, in a space where all of those gravitational changes because of you know, mm -hmm. the ongoing stress in the world are not affecting you? Well, Steve, that's a good question because that has come up in the mm -hmm. 727 MAX um, mm -hmm. scenario. And I push back on that every time. Mm -hmm. um, a month, month and a half after the Ethiopian incident, we had 38 heads of civil aviation authorities come to Dallas to, to talk, and it was a very robust and energetic discussion what do we need to do? How do we, how do we come together and share everything we know and everything we have? Uh, aviation is um, incredibly collaborative. Uh, and when you get um, all of these, these entities and executives focused on the same thing, it's, it's not that hard to do. So particularly with the MAX, the world has, um, despite what you may have read, has really come together. Uh, because it's a global question. Um, these happen on two ends of the earth. Right. Uh, so we're, we're um, very collaborative. Well, let me open the floor to the audience. Questions, comments? We've got someone in the very back. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Clemens and uh, Mr. Ewell. My name's Todd Wiggins of meetmedc.com. So I wanted to go back to a question that you had just a minute ago, Steve, which I think is even deeper than you even realize. And you, you asked... Um, about what's going on globally and are we the best or is America out ahead? And uh, you sort of responded, Mr. Elwell, that there's no competition or it's not a competition, quote. However, it seems as though with military applications, it clearly would be. Mm -hmm. And every day I go on Yahoo, I see that Russia's developed a new hypersonic missile or I hear that China's doing this in the South mm -hmm. China Sea, et cetera, et cetera. So if we're cooperating but we're still stabbing each other in the back militarily, then how what is really happening to innovation that's it's, uh, starting here in the U.S.? Well, thanks for that question. It's a good question. Um, but we have a, obviously, aeronautics and aviation is aviation, but there is a clear line <clears throat> between um, civilian innovation and civilian technology and uh, for the civil airspace system and strategic interests. Um, and while they may um, follow the same formulas and, and, and science, um, we uh, are not hindered in any way by um, what, uh, you know, what, what some um, military research in a missile is, vice um, how we're getting better uh, human interface in the cockpits of commercial jets. Mm. Um, I, I don't see it. Now, ITAR, most people probably in this room know about ITAR. Um, there is, uh, you know, things that we have to follow that, that and developments on a military aircraft that can't be shared or put on a commercial aircraft and then shared. But that, that's not what, when I was talking about um, how collaborative we are and how open we are. It, it, it doesn't include that. We're, we're right at the end, but, but just to finish up, because we've got Senator Cruz coming out here in a minute, I would ask you about, you know, I know his literacy in this stuff is great, but I'd love to ask you about the literacy of Congress, but we'll do that the next time you're up here. <laughs> um, but I think the, the, the more interesting question is when you talk about the kind of tracking and the sort of um, world that you describe with next gen and, and coming mm -hmm. in. And I, I am fascinated by the fact that you're creating a kind of internet of things of mm -hmm. aviation is essentially what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Real time information, yep. huge data, uh, artificial intelligence. And so when I think of those things, I think of massive expenditures. Do you have mm -hmm. the budget to achieve what you're doing or mm -hmm. are you uh, uh, trying to do all this with, with, without the financing you, you need with a hand tied behind your back? Mm -hmm. No, we, we're, we're adequately um, resourced. Are you and, forced to say that? Um, what? No, <laughs> no, no, no yeah. I'm not. I, no. I, I, I truly believe it. Um, we uh, rely greatly on, as I said earlier, the innovation of industry. Mm -hmm. um, we leverage that every day uh, to help us get better as a regulator mm -hmm. and as a designer of air traffic control. Um, just one quick plug. We are... Um, uh, creating right now uh, a new office at the FAA called the Office of Innovation for that very thing, mm. uh, uh, an incubator, if you will, of new technology. Because we new technology ideas in aviation come to us all the time. We're not very 
good at moving as fast as industry can move. Mm. So we're looking very, very, uh, we're very interested in achieving the ability to move at the pace of industry. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for spending time with us. Daniel My Elwell, pleasure. Deputy Administrator of the FAA, thank you very much. It was really fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deputy Administrator Elwell. Thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure to have you with us this morning. And now it is time for the portion of the program produced by our underwriter, Delta Airlines. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Heather Wingate, the Senior Vice President of Government Affairs with Delta Airlines. And joining Heather on stage is Marlene Colucci, Executive Director of the Business Council. Heather and Marlene, over to you. Good morning. Morning, Peter. Good morning, everybody. Um, as Peter mentioned, my name is Marlene Colucci. I head up the Business Council in Washington, D.C. And it's a real pleasure to be here with you this morning, and especially a pleasure to be able to ask some questions of my good friend Heather Wingate, um, who is the Senior Vice President over at Delta Airlines. We've known each other now for actually a number of years, so when Steve asked me to do this, I said, this is terrific. Um, Heather is one of the most accomplished women I've met in Washington. She not only heads up Delta Airlines, but before that, she headed up the office of MetLife. Um, she also did a stint with Nomura and also with Citi. Uh, and then to add to her credentials in the administration, she worked in the White House. Um, she worked at USTR and also worked in the US Senate. So she's, she's done it all. Um, so please welcome Heather. Um, Heather, I thought I'd get started by asking you a question about the theme of this event. It's called Innovation Runway. And I know all of everybody in the audience, I'm sure, has had their own flight experiences. So I'd love to have you share a little bit about what Delta's doing to kind of innovate when it comes to the experience of flying. Yeah, thank you so much, Leslie. Um, absolutely, we are really doubling down on our investment in Air, and the, the airplanes themselves in the airports, as well as in technology in general, which of course is the theme. Um, so I'll take just a minute to focus specifically on our investments on the ground, um, where the numbers are pretty staggering and historic at this point. Um, over the next five years, uh, we're committing $12 billion to airport infrastructure. Um, and this is on top of $7 billion in airport infrastructure that we've invested since 2006. It's incredibly important to the customer experience. Uh, we have to build on not only our reliability and our customer service, which is important, but really invest in innovation and infrastructure specifically. Uh, one project I'll mention in particular that many in the, of you in the room may be very well aware of is our $4 billion investment in New York's LaGuardia Airport. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's a little painful right now, but trust me, um, when we're done building this um, $4 billion state-of-the-art terminal, it's going to be a better experience both for passengers who are um, originating and ending their travel in New York, as well as those who are connecting through LaGuardia. Um, we also are investing across our, our airports. That includes in Salt Lake, for example, in Atlanta, of course, in Seattle, and in LAX. And we have a lot of information on all of these investments on our deltatakingaction.com, which I hope you'll visit. Well, it's kind of exciting, especially as someone who is a flight connoisseur to hear upgrades uh, in, in the flying experience, because I always feel like all of us have these stories that we would love to share. In fact, I'm sure now that you have this job, you're getting a lot of stories told to you, right? A lot of Everybody's uh, an I, expert. Everybody has, we know yes. that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm certainly hoping I'm getting upgrades after this, but yeah. we'll see what happens. Um, interestingly, last month, uh, we had a meeting for the Business Council, which is a group of CEOs. We talked all about digital transformation and about technology and how is technology changing different industries. So how is it changing commercial aviation? Well, our, our commitment is to really um, alter the customer experience for the better through technology. And I'll just highlight a few um, technological adv advancements that we're making right now. Um, one that we invested in and created is actually a weather app that our pilots can use um, in the air where they can spot ahead of time turbulence and use that to avoid turbulence to make for a smoother ride. And um, we also are providing free uh, in-flight text messaging, which is good for everybody. We all don't want to feel like we're all of a sudden out of touch when we get up in the air. And my favorite, honestly, because it's just kind of empowering, is uh, knowing where your bag is. You know, when you check a bag, <laughs> we have RFID technology now so that you can actually see when your bag is loaded onto the plane. If you're making that connection, you're always worried, did my bag make that connection, especially if you're running a little tight. 
Uh, and now you can see, you know, just right there on the Delta app that your, your um, bag is on the plane you're on. Um, so, so you that's can track just some, it basically from the time that you check it yeah, all the way through and know exactly yeah, where it just is. Just download the Delta app and there you go. So, well, as someone who's had more than one lost bag, I really appreciate that. Yeah, um, it's um, yeah. it's pretty exceptional. And and one area where many in the industry are backing away, but we're investing even more heavily is in um, seat back entertainment. I mean, I fly every week, as I'm sure many of you do, and when I walk down the aisles, it's pretty clear that people enjoy seat back entertainment, and um, it gives them ability. I know what I do. You know, we all multi multitask nowadays. Is I'll be on my laptop checking my my emails, but I'll also be checking in on the news, maybe taking in a movie. Um, so we j and we also just passed our 700th plane where we have embedded um, in-flight entertainment. So we think people want to be entertained when they're in flight. Yeah, I think I've never understood why people were taking and other airlines taking it away because I'm I'm one of those people too. If it's a long flight, I want to make sure that I have something to keep me busy and just kind of get over the time period. Absolutely. So I can do that and text at the same time then. Yeah, and check your email too. This is good. It's all right this there. Is, all right, good. <laughs> I'll be fully functional then. Yes. So um, let me ask you a little bit about. Um, I think it was last week or, or a week before, I remember seeing your CEO, Ed Bastian, and he was on yeah. CNBC, and I think he was on Bloomberg, he was on a number giving earnings talks. But one of the things he talked about was the workforce and kind of what you're doing to upgrade your workforce and, and reinvest, I think is the word he used, yeah. in the Delta workforce. So can yeah. you explain or elaborate a little bit on that um, for this audience? Absolutely. I mean, Ed loves to talk about our people, and, and there's just no question that the Delta people make the Delta difference. And there's no technology in the world that's going to um, be more important than, frankly, just your people on the ground doing a good job and, and providing a good customer experience. Um, so for example, we really put our money where our mouth is when it comes to this. Um, we provide 15% of our profits every year into a profit sharing program for our employees. So that that's means 15% of the profits on top of salary goes into our people. Um, over the, since 2008, we've provided an 80% annual compensation increase for our people. I don't, I don't know if there's any company that can say that. And over the last 11 years, we've had 11 consecutive pay increases in, in base salary for our, for our folks. And that includes just, um, just this month, we're still in October, a 4% increase in base pay for our employees that um, we just put into effect. Um, so it's incredibly important, and, and it's something that we're completely committed to uh, we, we, our people are the Delta difference, without question. And specifically, speaking mm -hmm. of Ed, I will mention that, um, in, in, on theme mm -hmm. for, for the program today, is that uh, he's going to be headlining the Consumer Electronics Show in uh -huh. Las Vegas uh, this coming January 2020. It'll be the first time that an airline CEO is providing a keynote at the CES, which is truly the world-renowned innovation forum. And so we're very excited about that. And it's just an opportunity for us to um, show an even richer commitment and long-term commitment to technology programming and to our technology investment. I was gonna say, and he's, he's such a good spokesperson, I think, for the company too. You know, I was saying back on the workforce, I think um, he mentioned too that you had hired about 6,000 employees, which seems like a huge number. Yeah, that's, um, and this is all to supplement the workforce as it currently stands. Yeah, that's exactly right. We, we are hiring really across the board. Um, and, and these are good paying jobs. When you think about an airline maintenance programmer, I mean, a lot of these um, maintenance professionals are making, you know, in a pretty short period of time, they can be making a six figure salary. They don't need to take on the debt of a four-year liberal arts college education to do that. Mm -hmm. So in order to um, make sure that we've got that pipeline of the workforce that we need for really incredible jobs within the airline industry space, we're partnering with community colleges, for example, and ensuring that they've got the type of educational programming that can feed that pipeline into um, Delta. And um, you know, these are great jobs. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, it's so important, too, that they're making the investment in that. Which Absolutely. I feel like, uh, especially when you're flying or if you're going to a hotel, the best thing is to have a happy flight attendant so that your experience is much better. That is exactly right. It really does make a difference. Anything um, that you want to share on the policy front or any other things that are kind of at the forefront of what Delta is thinking as far as moving air travel forward, things that you need to see or would like to see to be able to improve you know, Delta's an airline, but also to improve the customer you know, opportunity? 
Yeah, I mean, the good news for us is that a lot of what we're doing, we really don't need government action, um, whether it comes to That's the right. partnerships with universities and community colleges to make sure that we have that pipeline of workforce. Mm -hmm. We're not waiting for government programs to be put in place to do that. We welcome it if it happens, but you can really go and partner with universities and community colleges without a big government program in place to do that. Um, similarly, when it comes to airport infrastructure, it would be fabulous if Congress got a, a large infrastructure bill passed in this Congress. We, we all want that. We want that for our country. But we are making these you know, $12 billion investments over the next five years, the $7 billion we've already put in place, without the need for a federal government program to do that. It, it's in our interest. Ultimately, if we right. take care of our people, our people take care of our customers, it's all a, a flywheel that's good for the company. So that's, that's really our mode and that's how we're operating. That's good and I think especially in this town everybody understands if you can operate without government <laughs> all the better. <laughs> but we're going to hear from government officials who I know will get things done. So it's been a pleasure talking with you Great and thanks so much you. for your time. I appreciate it. Yeah and, and thank, thank you, you all. for being here. Thanks. Thank you Heather and Marlene. Last night somewhere around the bottom of the seventh or eighth inning I started to get a little bit worried about this next introduction, but fortunately the Nats pulled it out, at least game one. So it is now indeed my pleasure to introduce the senator from Texas, Senator Ted Cruz. A Republican from the great state of Texas, Senator Cruz was first elected to the Senate in 2012. The senator currently sits and serves as the chairman of the Committee on Commerce, Science and Transportation, Subcommittee on Aviation and Space. The subcommittee has jurisdiction over all civil aviation research, safety, and protection of consumers. Senator, thank you so much for being here. Please welcome back Steve Clemens, our editor-at-large, who will lead the conversation. Thank you both. Thank you, Peter. Yes, you can, you can applaud. There we go. Uh, so my colleague Peter Greenberger can be a bit of a jerk sometimes. Um, <laughs> You know, in, in, in the sense that he said, Steve, you got to come up and mention the Nats and the Astros. And I said, look, I grew up in Japan and I don't know American sports. I just do sumo. Uh, so I guess something happened with the Nats and the Astros. Uh, how do you feel after that? Was it okay for you? No. <laughs> so, so I will just say that, that there is karma in the world. So, so last night I was having dinner at Capitol Grill and uh, Chuck Schumer happened to be having dinner there as well. And, and, you know, we all have an angel and a devil on our shoulders, and, and, and in this instance, the devil prevailed, and so I did have to go up to Chuck and <laughs> express my condolences at the Astros whipping the Yankees' ass, um, uh. which, which Chuck appreciated. Um, I, I think I did point out to him, so, so the Yankees have won the pennant every decade since the 19-teens. And this is the first decade they haven't won the pennant. Mm. And the Astros have beaten them three times. So I was feeling pretty good about myself until I finished the dinner, came home, and hit. By the way, I'm at dinner during the game. Steve Scalise is in the room next to me watching the game. And so I'm trying to tell everyone, quiet, I'm on a media blackout. I want to know nothing about the game till I get home mm. and watch it on DVR. So I watch it on DVR until late in the evening. And uh, not a great outcome. But it was game one. Well, look, I've always thought this series is going to go to six or seven. I think the Nats are a great team, but I still think the Astros are going to win. Well, that's great. Well, I wanted the history books to show that Steve Clemens, for the first time in history, opened an interview on a sports question. <laughs> we avoided it. We jumped over impeach. We could have impeachment runway and ask you about that, but I'm really interested in innovation runway. Uh, I, I will say yeah. I am happy to be collecting on a wager uh, uh, from Kirsten Gillibrand, uh, who is going to be presenting to me something she calls New York barbecue, which I'm skeptical this actually exists, right. uh -huh. um, and, and New, New York Mark. whiskey, which I do know exists, and, and, and the, the, the real kicker terms of the wager uh, are, are, are that she has to present it now wearing an Astros hat. Um, now, I'd feel good about that, except yesterday I made a follow-up wager with Tim Kaine on, on the World Series. <laughs> so now I'm on the hook for Texas barbecue, which most assuredly exists, Shinerbach beer, and, and if we lose, I end up wearing a Nats hat. So I'm looking forward to collecting from Tim, hopefully, and not, uh, not being on the losing end of that wager. Well, I hope that goes well for you, I think. I don't know which, <laughs> sport, uh, which, which side I'm on. But let me ask you a quick question. I was, I was intrigued, and I, and I do want to, you know, sometimes these are opportunities to share, share personal stuff. I did not know that your mother 
and father were both um, serious mathematicians. Your dad was an IBMer, but uh, you know, to me, uh, equally interesting is your mom uh, was involved in computing and 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 figuring out the orbits of Sputnik. Yeah, uh, I just tweeted that out. It went kind of viral. So. Uh, who would have, I mean, I did not know yet that Ted Cruz came from a math background. Are people surprised? It, it's, uh, you know, yeah. I grew up in a techie home, but, mm. but both my parents are mathematicians and computer programmers. And um, my mom is, is Irish-Italian. She grew up in, mm. in Wilmington, Delaware. And she ended up being the first person in her family ever to go to college. And she went to Rice uh, and graduated in 1956 uh, with a degree in math. And a story I've told before, you know, a couple of years ago when the movie came out, mm. that I took my daughters to see the movie Hidden Figures, right. which is just, just about a the human wonderful, computers. Yes, it's yeah. a wonderful, wonderful movie. And so I took both girls, I took Heidi and I took my mom. Mm. So we all went to see it, and, and it's as inspirational as any movie can be. Um, and afterwards, I, I sat and talked. My, my girls are eight and eleven. And so as we were putting them to bed, we had kind of a long conversation about the movie that night. And uh, it was interesting on a couple of fronts. One, you know, the movie shows uh, segregation and discrimination. So, you know, one of the great scenes is when Kevin Costner goes and takes a baseball bat and knocks down the sign that says colored restroom. And, and my daughters had never seen segregation. And they were mm. really puzzled, like, why on earth would anyone, this is really stupid. Why does this, and so we had a, very interesting conversation, and I think a good conversation for the girls about the country's troubled history on race relations and, and the legal and social environment that existed for a long, long time uh, as, as discrimination was codified in law. Um, but we also had a conversation where, you know, that movie begins with their computing the orbits uh, of Sputnik. Mm. And, um, and, I, and I told the girls, I said, you know, you realize... Mimi was doing that. That's what they call my mm. mom is Mimi. Um, so when she graduated Rice, she went to work for Shell. Mm. And her first job was a computer programmer. Um, and if you can imagine, talk about two industries, oil and gas and computer programming, neither one of which were remotely friendly to women. And, and my mom was mm. at the intersection of both. Uh, so, so I remember as a kid, she used to tell me a... a story about how she very deliberately didn't learn how to type. Hmm. And, and her reasoning was, she said, look, this was the 1950s. I, I understood the world I was living in. And she said she'd be walking down the hallway at, at Shell. She would have been demeaned. And, and yeah. a man would come up to her and say, hey, sweetheart, hmm. would you type this thing for me? Hmm. And my mom wanted to be able to smile very, very sweetly and say, you know, I, I would love to help you out. Hmm. I don't know how to type. I, I guess right. she got to use me as a computer programmer instead. Right. Fascinating story. And it takes me right to my question yep. about the 737 Max. Yep. Because your mom, your she parents... She did not program that. Yeah, but your mom was at an age where uh, complexity, mathematics, simulation were becoming part of our world, whether yep. it was in oil yep. and energy or it was, you know, looking at space flight. And around the time of the crash of the Ethiopian Airlines plane that had, that had followed the Indonesian uh, Lion Air uh, downing, uh, President Trump tweets, airplanes are becoming far too complex to fly. Pilots are no longer needed, but rather uh, we need scientists from MIT, i.e. your mom, uh, to, that old and simpler is far better. Is the president right? Oh, look, I think lots of people have natural concerns about technology. Technology uh, is incredibly disruptive, mm. uh, and it can be unsettling. And, and, and that's true with all technological But this is innovations. the president of the United States. Uh, but yeah. he's a yeah. human being. Yeah. And, and, and I, look, the sentiments he's expressing are not unusual. A lot mm. of people f feel, feel that way. Um, you know, I, I, I look at the, the evolution of the business model, the evolution of the economy and the industry, and they're always major transitions. Uh, you know, when the automobile was introduced, the horse and buggy producers mm. weren't very happy about it. Right. Um, that at, at, at every stage, whether it's new energy sources, new transportation sources, there's always disruption. Um, we are certainly on a path to more and more driverless transportation. I, I don't know if it's mm. a couple of years around the road or 10 years or 50 years. But not far. But, but we're not mm. far. Um, 
I think, as with any technology, there'll be a time period before people are comfortable and satisfied with them. Mm. I think when it comes to airplanes, there's no doubt that, that, that pilots uh, play a critical role, both in terms of keeping the plane safe, but also mm. in terms of, of giving passengers comfort that they have somebody and hopefully a couple of somebodies up front that they can trust to mm -hmm. respond to an emergency situation. But I'll, I'll give an example. I did a few months ago an event uh, with Uber, mm. uh, which is a great example of technology disrupting. Um, and, you know, Uber's getting into aviation. They have Uber Air, which they're, they're installing in, in Dallas, Texas is the first city. They're actually trying to do it in Dallas and L.A. And I made a wager on stage. I said, I promise you Dallas will be easier to do business with. And they weren't willing to take that bet because they're like, yeah, mm. no, it's unequivocally the case. Um, right. But Uber Air are these electric helicopters that are going to go from North Texas, from the Plano area down to DFW. Uh, and I've had the chance to get in them and I've had the chance. They actually have a great virtual reality display mm. uh, where you can look out and see it. And, and the plan is it's just like a, ordering an Uber. And actually, they are saying that the pricing will be the same as ordering an Uber Black. So you can literally on your phone come in, all right, I want me a helicopter. Now, it doesn't yet come to your backyard. You have to go to a place to get on it. So if John Cornyn is there, there'll be surge pricing. Yeah, that yeah, that yeah. could be. Yeah. But the insides are clean and sleek. I mean, right. the inside right. is like a Tesla. I'd say even cleaner yeah. and sleeker than that. So right now, the Uber Air helicopters have a pilot, and, it, and it's the most streamlined cockpit you've ever seen. It's basically a joystick. Uh, I mean, it, it mm. looks like a video game. But what they've candidly admitted, they, they don't actually think they need a pilot. I mean, this is, they're designing this to be pilotless. Mm. But they're acknowledging that at least right now, if you want people to get in the helicopter, they need to see a pilot to have the comfort to get in right, the helicopter. Right, right, right. Uh, but I think they're looking forward to a time where, where, where that's not the case. So I want to ask you, you know, in the, in the little time we have, to talk a little bit about the innovations that you're excited about in your role as, uh, in, as oversight. But I, but I guess I want to ask you, before I do that, one question which I asked Dan Elwell, is in the, in the broad uh, picture of the 737 story. Because the 737 story is more than about an aircraft yes. and whatever. It's really yes. about trust. Yep. It's really a fundamental issue of trust and governance and whether the system just says, oops, we screwed up and where, where does accountability lie? And I asked Dan who the heroes and villains were in the story and he, he um, uh, cleverly sidestepped uh, answering my question and said we don't account, account for blame in this. But you, you do have to point yeah. uh, uh, to folks. So who do you point to in that story? And, and, and by pointing to them, how can the American public um, get trust back in a system? Uh, well, I, I'm not like sure there are any heroes right now. Um, and, and Washington is a town that doesn't do heroes very much. Um, but, but there may be more than a few villains. Hmm. And if you look at what happened with 737 MAX, I, I am very concerned. Um, I think the flying public is very concerned. Uh, and, and so in the wake of, of the second crash that occurred, um, I chaired a committee hearing that we brought in the FAA. We brought in a number of experts to look at what had happened. Next week, we've got the CEO of Boeing coming in to testify. I think that's going to be an important testimony. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we're still waiting for some of the answers to come through about what exactly occurred in the crash. But, but all the public reporting, all the early indications seem to indicate that, that, that the problem was this stabilization system that they called the MCAS system mm. and, and the computer that, that, that would adjust the trim and, and tilt the nose of the plane down automatically if the angle of attack was too steep. And, and um, in at least one of the two attacks, it appears what happened is that you had a bird shear that, that took off the angle of attack sensor outside the plane. And, and, and so the sensor was reading that it was way too steep. And so mm. the MCAS system was consistently adjusting the nose of the plane down. Um, and, and it appears both, both crashes had pretty similar characteristics in terms of the descent of the plane rapidly at the end. There are several things that are pretty messed up about it. One, when the MCAS was rolled out, look, the MCAS is kind of a, a jury rig because they put a much much bigger engine mm. on a 737, a bigger engine than it was designed to have. 
And so the computer system was designed to, to make it work with the larger engine. Um, unfortunately, if you look at, for example, the certification process and the pilot training process, both of those concern mm. me greatly. Um, pilots were not told about the MCAS system. Uh, they were not told what was going on and what was operating. If you look at the black boxes from the two crashes, um, the pilots didn't know what the hell was going on. Now, they were very inexperienced pilots. That, that, that is certainly a factor, that the airlines that were at issue were flying pilots who would never be flying U.S. airlines. They just didn't have the experience to fly it. Uh, but one of the components, when the MCAS starts shifting the nose down, the previous uh, 737, when you pulled the yoke back, it would disengage the stabilization. Under the current mm. 737 MAX, pulling the yoke back doesn't disengage the stabilization. And none of the pilot training explained to them mm. that when you pull the yoke back, it no longer disengages the stabilization. That, it seems to me, is a serious problem. When you have pilots say... So is that FAA and Boeing yes. and it's yes. everybody it, above? It, it is everybody. And, and listen... A frequent challenge in Washington is the problem of industry capture. Mm. And, and, and I think the FAA is particularly subject to that. I think there are enormous incentives to get very cozy uh, with, with a couple of big companies. And, and I'm all for efficiencies, but we need to... The safety of the flying public is paramount. Uh, and, you know... Listen, I'm, I'm on an airplane several times a week. Mm. My family is on an airplane all the time. Um, aviation is fundamental to commerce in this country. It's fundamental to, to life in this country. But you've got to have the flying public comfortable and willing to get on a plane and believing mm -hmm. that, that, that they're, they're going to be safe. And it is still the case that flying a plane is much, much safer than getting in a car. But, but the 737 MAX, 346 people were killed. Right. And, and those were preventable deaths. And, and so um, I, for one, as chair, chairman of the Aviation and Space Committee, I'm, I'm going to keep focusing on understanding what went wrong. What went wrong in the regulatory process? Why did they sign off on a training system where the pilots aren't told about this new, new operation that could endanger the, the system? And how can we make sure, how can we fix it? How can we make it better? So... We're out of time, but I'm going to tell my team we're going to go a little bit over. Um, I, I, I hear you. Senators and, are never known for filibustering. And, yeah, and, <laughs> but as I, you know, I know you've got legislation, a commercial space bill, and NASA reauthorization, and you cover uh, everything from drones to, um, you know, as you said, the, ne the, the, the next trillionaire in space or the first trillionaire in space. I think in that broad picture, when you think about technology and innovation, which we're, which we're discussing today, quantum computing, yep. uh, 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 AI, uh, the application of data in real time to all of these questions. To me, this sounds like something where we don't have your mom on, on you know, to check the equations, but uh, how do you prevent the same kind of incident from happening in a world where we're really going to make a strategic leap into a completely different set of technology opportunities, but there are also technology risks? So it's an enormous challenge, and it's one that's going to strain the regulatory systems in Washington. Uh, we were talking before about driverless cars, right. um, the world of drones. And when you suddenly have airspace uh, and the number of aircraft, large and small, in, in the airspace growing by 10x or 100x, um, how does the regulatory system accommodate for that? You know, for five years, I've chaired the space subcommittee, the Senate Commerce Committee. And, and, and space, I think, is a good uh, look forward. Space mm. is an area where, where it's actually encouraging, despite the, the partisan circus that is Washington. Space has been an area that, that we have had significant bipartisan cooperation. And, and so mm. I've been able to pass uh, repeatedly serious legislation on space, even in this hyper-partisan mm. environment. So in 2015... I authored the Commercial Space Launch Competitiveness Act. President Obama signed that into law. Uh, in 2017, I authored the NASA Reauthorization Act, first reauthorization for NASA in, in, in seven years. President Trump signed that into law. If you think about it, there are very few areas where you have two pieces of major substantive legislation, one, one signed by Obama, one signed by Trump. 
Um, I think that illustrates some of the bipartisan cooperation we've had. Um, one of the things about commercial space, and I think there's a, a lesson for the aviation piece, part of what we're seeing in space exploration is government quite eager and willing to partner with the commercial space sector. That if we're mm -hmm. going to go back to the moon, if we're going to go to Mars, it's going to take an investment of a magnitude that, that, quite frankly, the taxpayers aren't willing to foot the bill. Mm. And so what we're seeing right now is a leverage system where, where NASA, their, NASA's budget is growing, it's focused on exploration, but much of the policies are designed to incentivize commercial space and major investments from commercial space so we have the resources, the innovation to do what we need to do. Now, this year was the first time on commerce that space and aviation have linked. Those have always been separate subcommittees. This year, the two subcommittees were combined, so it's now the aviation and space subcommittee. So the aviation mm. piece is a new piece of jurisdiction for me. Um, I, you know, I like to joke, now, now our jurisdiction is everything one foot off the ground and all the way up. Mm. Um, and, and I'm excited about the aviation piece. Obviously, in Texas, there are a ton of jobs that, that, that aviation generates. They mm. matter intensely for the state of Texas. I think there are some lessons in terms of, look, aviation is driven by the private sector. It's driven by, uh, we have incredible companies making airplanes. We have incredible airlines in this country. We have, we have incredible, on the defense side, defense innovators making phenomenal planes. I've actually gotten to fly mm -hmm. an F-35 simulator, which is very cool. Did you crash? Okay, you want to talk about technology. <laughs> Astonishingly, no. So I'm in the simulator. I'm, I'm surprised. I'm, I'm flying up. I am too. I, I don't know how to fly. Um, I'm flying up, and, and we're coming along, and we see a couple of Russian MiGs. This is still mm. sort of Top Gun uh, era uh, simulation, I guess. A couple of Russian MiGs, and the instructor's standing over my left shoulder. He says, okay, look, they can't see you. Uh, you're stealth. He said, just mark them. So I, like, like mark them. He said, mm. all right, go away. They, you know where they are let's go on a bombing run and let's go take out this factory over here. So I'm like, okay, cool. So I pull over and bomb the factory and hit the factory. And I said, all right, come back. Let's go get those MiGs. So I fire two missiles at the MiGs. He said, the first time they're going to see you is when the missile is coming and is locked on them. And that's the first thing they're going to see. And so I took out mm. the two MiGs. Then the simulation shifts to land on an aircraft carrier. Mm. Now, I can't fly. So no one in their right mind would entrust me with, with a glider, much less an F-35, to land on an, on an aircraft carrier. What's interesting is the technology. On the screen, there was basically a trapezoid that, mm. that, that you're with, with, with the stick you're directing. And it was essentially guide the trapezoid onto the runway. And if you guide the trapezoid on the runway, the computer systems are such that even an idiot can land it, and I am proof of that because I landed the damn plane and it didn't crash into the ship, and, and at least according to the simulator, everyone survived and it worked. So that, that was very cool, and it's an amazing testament to the technology that you don't have to be an experienced pilot to be able to, be able to handle that, that, that amazing Fa piece of technology. Fascinating. Just, just several quick questions, hopefully quick answers, uh, and then we've got to get going. The, the, You've talked a lot about the commercial side of space, and as I told you, I was talking to, to Senator Joe Manchin uh, recently at West Virginia, and it remi I was reminded that after Sputnik, we had a lot of innovation in the backyards of regular people, you know, with rockets, and West Virginia was one of the homes of these rocketeers uh, in the early days. Today, the rocketeers are billionaires. Does yep. that bother you? No, um, because, look, there, there, there's innovation. You mentioned before something I've said. I think the first trillionaire hmm. uh, is going to be made in space. The, and I don't know how it'll be. Maybe it'll be asteroid mining that we go and land and discover rare earth materials or even substances that we don't know about. Um, maybe it will hmm. be habitation on the moon. I mean, we don't know yeah, what it will be, right. but it is. If you look at the, 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 the growth of, of, of the economy, the growth of mankind, the next great frontier uh, drives innovation, it drives uh, economic expansion, but more importantly than that, it, it inspires hope. Mm. Um, you know, it, it was actually at Rice University uh, where, where, where John F. Kennedy gave his famous speech where he said, in the next decade, we'll go to the moon. Mm. And, and, and that's, you know, in my hometown of Houston. And in fact, one of the things you may, you may not know that Kennedy said, to go back, you started with a sports reference, I'll give you another one. 
uh, which is Kennedy said there, why does Rice play the University of Texas? They do not do so because it is easy, but rather they do so because it is hard. <laughs> and, and that was the analogy he used for why will we we're, go to we're space. We're going way too over, but are you worried about China beating us? Yes, yes, yes. Um, two weeks ago, I was in Asia, was in Pearl Harbor, Japan, Taiwan, India, Hong Kong. Was designed to be really a friends and allies tour all around mm. China, all dealing with the growth of China. The investment China is putting into modernization is, is truly frightening. They're doing much of it with intellectual property they've stolen from us. So it's our innovations that they're getting on the cheap and they're investing in a big way. Uh, China is by far the greatest geopolitical threat the United States faces in the coming decades and centuries. And space in particular, we're seeing the weaponization of space. It's one of the reasons I, I support and have encouraged the president moving forward with the Space Force. Because I think we need to treat very seriously a question I ask military commanders all the time. I say, how often are you training in a spaced out mm. environment? Our technology is fabulous. But what happens if the satellites go down? You know, can you mm. steer your incredibly modern jet if you have no GPS? Um, can you target your weapon system? How many right. times has the captain of an aircraft carrier practiced steering with a compass in the stars. If all the fancy computers right. stop working because they've taken out the technology, I think that is a huge threat. I think we need to invest a great deal more. Mm. On the defense side, the Senate Armed Services Committee, I, I passed into law legislation directing DOD to implement a test bed for the first space-based missile uh, interception technology, which I think is a critical piece. If you mm. look at how to stop say, a rogue launch from North Korea. North Korea has substantial cache of nukes, their ICBM capacity. By the way, those ICBMs are not designed to hit South Korea or Japan. The ICBMs are designed to hit us. If you want to intercept mm. a missile, particularly a nuclear missile, by far the best place to do it is in, in what's called boost phase, right. right when it's taking off. It's much slower. Look, it's starting from a speed of zero and, and picking up. It's much slower. Mm -hmm and they can't deploy countermeasures. Look, right now our technology for missile intercept is designed to get the missile when it's coming back into the atmosphere. It's moving much, much faster. It can deploy countermeasures. It can deploy multiple warheads. Uh, the, the, the chances of success are much smaller. If you can take it out on the launch pad, your success rates are much higher. And also, mm. if there are bad materials, whether nuclear or biological or right. chemical in the missile, We'd much rather they fall back on the launch country that's trying to attack us than then they fall on us. Uh, and, and to take out a missile in boost phase takes space-based interceptors. We've got mm -hmm. that technology, and thankfully, that's been an area I've been pushing DOD now for seven years. I think we're making real progress to implement it. Senator, I can tell you're really enjoying talking about all this stuff instead of impeachment. Uh, but but I am. What's that uh, topic? Yeah, yeah, I, I'm not yeah. familiar with that. But but, but it, it, just as we finish, just real short, because I, I do need to ask you a question. As you, yeah, I mean, I know your views on on the current impeachment um, uh, side of things right now. But what you've just shared with us are some very substantive, you know, uh, positions on policy issues. As you think about, you know, the somewhat somber responsibilities of the U.S. Senate uh, in this process, which has begun, how do you weigh the attention that world gets versus? You're thinking about, you know, innovation in the future of everything afoot and, and higher. Look, I, I think it is a frustrating time right now. It's frustrating on a couple of levels. One, as a country, we're really divided right now. I mean, there is an anger, there's a rage. That's not healthy. It's not good for America. Uh, we're so atomized. We're so polarized. Uh, what worries me about that is we're not talking to each other anymore. Um, the left is in its own world. It only listens to left-wing news. The right is in it, its own world. It only listens to right-wing news. Um, if someone disagrees with you, you unfriend them. And so the homogenizing institutions of, of society, you know, it used to be that you would, you'd go to work, you'd go to church, you'd go to school with, with people where, you, you know, you'd know a Democrat, you'd know a Republican, you'd know someone who'd disagree, and, and, and you could disagree without hating them. Mm. Um, 
The rhetoric and anger we have right now is, I think, very worrisome. And when it comes to Congress, I, I think the next year we are going to be in an absolute partisan circus. Uh, as far as I can tell, the only objective in the Pelosi House is to attack the president, issue subpoenas, and pursue impeachment. That means there is no appetite there for, for addressing any of the real challenges we have in this country, addressing any of the real problems uh, that the American people want. And, and when I go home to Texas, mm. you know, it was interesting. For, we had two years of the Mueller investigation. We had Russia, Russia, Russia. And, and you'd, you'd walk down the hall, and every question was about Russia. There was such a divide because I'd go home to Texas and no questions were about Russia. It, it was a beltway obsession about the latest partisan battle. Um, I think the American people are interested in us doing our jobs. And, and, and my number one priority is jobs. Mm. That's what Texans want. More jobs, higher wages, more opportunity. That's why the topics we're discussing right now, innovation, mm. how you have a regulatory system that doesn't burden innovation. One of the reasons commercial space has prospered is we've deliberately pursued a light-touch regulatory environment so that commercial space innovators can innovate. Um, those are the topics that interest me. National security, defending ourselves against China, defending sure. ourselves against rogue states. Um, and, and so, you know, I, all of us remember back to the Clinton administration. And, uh, and a group that was formed then was moveon.org. Mm. Um, I think there are a lot of people that are already in the mode of moveon.org. Okay, we get mm. you hate the president. That, that has been adequately conveyed. Now do your job anyway. And, and mm. I, I hope we will. We may have some rocky months ahead before Congress actually gets back this, to do, this doing This was so job. much more of a fun interview than I expected. Uh, but, but uh, uh, Senator Cruz, thank you so much okay. for spending time with us. I, 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 yeah. Do, yeah. I, I do have to say on that, you know, Heidi and I met on the George W. Bush campaign. Right. And, and George W. Bush made famous in the context of, of education the phrase, the soft bigotry of low expectations. <laughs> so I am glad to have exceeded Senator, the bar. Thank you. I hope I, uh, we can go on for hours, and I hope someday you'll let us. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Cruz. I wish you luck tonight, but not too much luck. Great to have you with us this morning. Uh, for more on the future of the U.S. aviation and the innovation taking place throughout the industry, we now turn to this morning's panel of terrific leaders in the aviation space. Please join me in welcoming on stage, first, Ed Mortimer, Vice President of Transportation and Infrastructure with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Mortimer oversees the development and the implementation of the Chamber's transportation and infrastructure policy and represents the Chamber on Capitol Hill, as well as before the administration and industry organizations. Matthew Sweeney, founder and CEO of Flirty. Mr. Sweeney is an Australian-born American aviation and technology entrepreneur and inventor. Under his leadership, Flirty is the leading independent drone delivery service with a mission to save lives and improve lifestyles by making delivery instant for everyone. Flirty first made history in 2015 when it conducted the first FAA-approved drone delivery. Emily Feenstra, Managing Director of Government Relations and Infrastructure Initiatives with the American Society of Civil Engineers. Ms. Feenstra leads the organization's public affairs and government relations, including the development of their infrastructure report card. And last but not least, Charles Leoka, President of Travelers United. Mr. Leoka has been working in DC as a consumer advocate for a decade. He has testified before Congress repeatedly regarding airline travel issues and was appointed as the first consumer member of the Advisory Committee for Aviation Consumer Protection by the Secretary of Transportation. Moderating this morning's panel will be Raphael Bernal, our staff writer with The Hill. Raphael, thank over you. to you. Thank you. Morning and welcome. Um, Emily, I'm going to start with you. Uh, the Society of Civil Engineers uh, seems to keep giving pretty bad grades to the United States in terms of uh, infrastructure. How did this country become a D student in infrastructure? Sure. So we do have the report card, the infrastructure report card comes out once every four years. And we had a D plus across 16 categories in 2017. And that just really reflects 
kind of a backlog of maintenance needs across our infrastructure sectors, the fact that we've kind of taken a generation off from investing in infrastructure, and what that means for aviation, we have a D in aviation. Um, a lot of that has to do with capacity and congestion. So actually, the runways are in pretty good shape. They're 97, 98% uh, excellent fair condition. We don't tolerate potholes on our runways as much as on our roads, um, but it's really the congestion at the airports. We see five to 7,000 airplanes in the air at any given time, 2.5 million passengers a day. Uh, this audience is probably familiar with 35X, that dreaded gate at Washington National Airport. So that's kind of the poster child of some of these capacity issues and uh, the fact that we need to modernize and expand to be ready for the future of aviation. So safety and security wise, we're okay, but the consumer and the uh, is doing great. Yeah, safety and security. Um, what we look at really is kind of the expanded footprint that you need with new modern security. The fact that it is taking up more space and we need to reflect that when we plan for our airport facilities. Now, Charlie, you, you advocate for consumers. Um, th there's one data point that, that Emily mentioned that we are on track to once a week see Thanksgiving Day style packing in airports. What, what does this mean for the consumer? What, what do you, like, where do we start fixing the situation for, for the paying customer? Well, I think that the biggest thing that the paying customer needs to realize is that almost every day is Thanksgiving Day these days. It used to be that we got up to 85% or 90% uh, load factors during Thanksgiving. And now we're sitting at that with some airlines every single day. And so I think that in terms of crowds, that's at the airport, that's one thing. However, the airports have been doing a fairly good job of, of dealing with it. Uh, the other section, we talk about the um, uh, capacity of airports and so on. We need to keep moving forward on their air traffic control systems. And we had a big debate in Washington this last year over um, whether or not we're going to set up a separately funded uh, air traffic control system and modernize with um, a new type of funding. And we ended up losing, and when I say we, I mean uh, consumer groups, my group, um, uh, the airlines and uh, airports and so on, who were all fighting to bring in the new air traffic control system, ended up still dealing with the FAA and, um, and with federal funding, which comes in um, in hits and misses, let's say. So I think that we need to look at ways to smooth out the uh, development of the air traffic control system, and that in itself will probably be the biggest consumer benefit that we as consumers could look for. We're going to have you know, more on-time arrivals, we'll have faster um, um, uh, travel times, we'll have less fuel costs and so on. So a lot of that is coming along, and however, in the United States, we are behind the rest of the world. Right. And, and Ed, the, the, I mean, obviously aviation is critical to the economy. Mm -hmm. Transportation in general is critical to the economy. Yep. You mentioned you, you, have a, you lead a four-point plan yep. to start to improve the situation. Can you walk us through that quickly? Sure. So at the Chamber, we believe we need to modernize our infrastructure and broadly infrastructure, not just in aviation but our roads and bridges, also our energy sector. And so we put out a four-point plan about a year and a half ago um, that basically had four points for, for surface transportation. And I mentioned this in the aviation sector for roads, bridges, and transit. We need to make sure our airports have that intermodal connectivity. So we believe we need to modernize that infrastructure and we need to raise revenue to pay for that. So we call for adjusting the federal fuel tax, which is how we pay for those systems right now. Um, by five cents a year over a five-year period. Number two, where, we make, where it makes sense, we need to encourage more private investment. Um, and in the aviation sector, there's already a strong private sector component, but there's more to be had there. We need to look at all of the funding and financing opportunities. Um, I look at aviation, we, we look at a couple things. We look at, as I mentioned earlier, the infrastructure in and out of airports. Uh, Charlie, you talked upon the air traffic control modernization. Um, while we did have a big debate about it, the debate ended, but the problem hasn't gone away. We need to find a way to have all the stakeholders come together and figure out a way to modernize the system. We can argue about whether it's within the FAA, out of the FAA. The reality is, though, as Charlie mentioned, we're falling behind, and we need to come together as a nation and figure out a way 
to modernize the system. Matthew is bringing on new entrants into the field, right, with drones. Um, right now, we're operating with 1950s technology, right? And, and, we have, and we know the amount of cargo is continuing to grow. We're in an e-commerce environment. So we need to have a, an air traffic control system. And, and Dan Elwell talked this morning about things like ASB, Datacom. We got to expedite that. And it's taken too long. Um, it's not acceptable, so we got to continue this discussion. We can't just let it go. And I think Senator Cruz held a hearing talking about, let's start this conversation again. Um, we don't know what the solutions are. We know that we all need to come together and that all the stakeholders, both the airline industry, the airports, the general aviation need to come together. And then finally is we need to provide some regulatory certainty in the permitting because we're not going to modernize the system. You're not going to have the business community willing to pay more unless we see some certainty in how long it takes to get a permit. We supported this administration's one executive order, which called for a two-year time limit for major federal projects. From our perspective, we'd rather the answer be no, and let's put limited dollars, because we all know dollars is always a concern. How do we make these investments? And it's going to take a shared responsibility of all the stakeholders in the debate. But if we don't utilize those dollars in an efficient manner, you're not going to get people to pay in. So that was the plan we put out. We're disappointed that we're not having a broader infrastructure debate in Congress. It looks like we're focusing on a surface bill, but we're not giving up. We have our Infrastructure Now campaign, which I wear the button all the time. It's something the business community for long-term sustained economic growth needs to occur. Yeah, the, the Infrastructure Week, uh, it, it grew, uh, that, that joke grew old after a few weeks of it not being Infrastructure Week. Right. Matt, I, I, I want to move to you. Um, so we're, we're talking about this 1950s technology and sort of this abuse of 1950s technology. We have millions of people using a method of transportation that's basically post-war. And then you're coming along with a, a method of transportation that's not moving people, that's com that almost seems sci-fi. Um, you said, Flirty's mission is to save lives and improve lifestyles by making delivery drones available to everyone. How do you save lives with, with drones? The leading cause of natural death in America is cardiac arrest. Despite all the money that we spend on healthcare, 350,000 people have a cardiac arrest in their home every year. Does anyone here know what percentage of those people survive? 90% of them die. The reason for that is ambulances take too long to arrive, despite all of the money that we spend on healthcare and on ambulances. Um, because they still get stuck in traffic. And so just one application of our technology is delivery of defibrillators by drone uh, to the homes of people who've had cardiac arrest. And when those defibrillators arrive faster than ambulances, they'll save lives. Uh, statistically, we think we can increase the survival rate from cardiac arrest from where it's at today, 10%, to about 50%, which is about a 5x increase. That will save about 150,000 lives a year nationwide. And each one of our delivery drones will save one life every two weeks on average with just one application of the technology. So when we talk about the risks that new technology pose, that needs to be balanced against the damage to society that occurs because that technology is delayed or not here yet. So Emily, he hearing, hearing these perspectives and, and these needs, <laughs> From an engineering perspective, what, what is the first step? What is the most necessary first thing that needs to happen to start you know, moving that D plus or D up to a, hopefully a B at least? I mean, I would echo um, the fact that we've just got to be ready. For engineers, it's a lot of back to basics. You think about connected vehicles, everybody's very excited about their potential, but they need roads that are well maintained and signage and lane guides and all of the rest. So I think it's same, the similar in aviation. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure our airports can handle the added traffic, whether that's passenger or cargo. We need to be ready for the innovations and make sure the airspace is used most efficient, efficiently. And then we can really optimize the potential of a lot of this innovation. Now we're talking, of course, about physical infrastructure, but there's also a bureaucratic infrastructure. Somebody has to make the rules and decide what color the signs are. Uh, Charlie, do, do you see, it, are the bureaucrats doing their job? Are they, are they moving at the speed of innovation? Well, frankly, no. Um, when we look at what's happening in terms of the air traffic control system, it's um, sort of like the poster child for innovation these days. 
if we were moving at the speed that everybody else is moving in the world, we wouldn't be still using dials on, uh, in airplanes. We would have a, a much more modernized system. We wouldn't have radar as from back to World War II, which is uh, still the main uh, system that we use for locating aircraft and so on. And so uh, those types of old world uh, technologies are limiting deployment of technologies such as unmanned aerial systems, and um, it's making it more difficult. Part of the good things that um, the FAA is doing is such, such as putting in the ADSB system, which is already into the, uh, and operational now, and they're getting ready to have all planes equipped to deal with it uh, in uh, 2020. However, that same system now can also provide us with identification of drones all across the world. And so we now have technology which was developed for a different program, the air traffic control system, now being utilized or could be utilized for drone control. So, Matt, uh, Matt on that point, uh, you know, being on the cutting edge of, of, of drone technology, do you, do you think that the FAA is agile enough in adapting to the technology that you're creating? You've made your own drones, right? You, you sort of invented invented your own little aircraft. So we hired the head of NASA's drone program um, and built uh, a full stack drone delivery technology from the ground up with safety and reliability front of mind. Um, uh, the president issued a presidential memorandum uh, uh, requesting that the DOT and the FAA fast track regulatory approval for routine commercial drone operations, including drone delivery. That was about two years ago, and we still don't have at scale routine drone delivery yet. Uh, from kind of the perspective of the innovators and the entrepreneurs, the technology is ready to go, and we're working with regulators to bring it to market. But speed is of the essence if America wants to be the global leader in this cutting new, uh, in, in this cutting edge new industry. I'll tell the audience to please start preparing your questions. We'll have a few minutes for your uh, for your questions with the panel. So. And where, where is, is there a sweet spot for public and private sectors to work together to, you know, get that, get an infrastructure week to finally happen on the physical side and get the, the regulatory side to sort of catch up to, uh, to innovation? Absolutely. So I think, um, you know, on the, on the infrastructure side, we're already seeing a lot of that happen. You look at what's going on at LaGuardia, um, JFK is going to be starting this, public-private partnerships that are rebuilding terminals. So I think that's already going on, and we're, we could see more of that. When it comes to the regulatory area, I, I think you know, we, it's easy to criticize government. The, the reality is government's always going to be slower than innovators like Matt. What we've kind of laid out at the chamber is, look, let's, let's be thoughtful. Let's allow the innovation and ingenuity of people like Matt to take place. So let's not pick winners. Let's provide some guideposts for safety standards, particularly. But let's allow innovators to innovate, and let's not pick the winners and losers. And in our opinion, at, the, at this point, while some will argue that it's been slow in coming, we think that you know, there's been a thoughtful uh, rollout at the FAA at looking at drone safety, at looking at some of the implementing regulations. Normally, you don't see the business community ask for government regulation. We need some. We just don't need too much. So it, it's a shared responsibility, but at the end of the day, um, you know, we need to have an aviation system that is the envy of the world, right? Yeah. We had that before. We're starting to question it without making some of these tough decisions. And it's going to take not just the federal government, but all the stakeholders to come together to make that. Um, I think we have the opportunity. We just all need to buck it up and get it done. Right. Um, I'm almost ready for your questions. Just one more for you, Emily. Uh, there's. If we need an, an aviation system that's the envy of the world, it takes, what, at least a decade from an engineer having an idea to a new airplane being available, and at least a decade, mm -hmm. to being available to the consumers. Is it too much to think of supersonic travel and the uh, Uber Air that, that the senator was talking about, you know, Jetsons kind of stuff, that the technology seems to exist? Is it too much to think that, that we'll see that in our lifetimes? I don't think at all. I mean, we have a project at AAC even just looking at the future of cities and mega cities to everything like floating cities. And we're 
intentionally trying to be thought provoking with that. But I think we've got to think long term about that Jetsons like future and believe that's possible, but also just address some of these short term issues. It just, you know, the plans are in place in a lot of cases. We just need that regulatory certainty, that longer term bills, longer term funding to get these projects off the ground. And that's more of the short term vision. Feel, if I could just add on that, I, I want to agree with Emily on this. Like, so we're all for new innovation and technology, but look, we got an airline industry that needs an updated air traffic control system. General aviation needs it. Um, we need to figure out a way to get it done. Um, you know, it's, it's obviously the debate about whether it's in the government or out of the government. That didn't go so well, but the, the problems aren't going away. We need to get back to the table and figure out some solutions here because we can't just, while the future is bright, we have some real world uh, concerns right now that our aviation sector is struggling to handle the capacity. We're looking at increased cargo. We're looking at increased passengers, looking to almost double in the next 15, 20 years. And so utilizing the airspace more efficiently is the only way we're going to be able to handle those types of increased cargo and passengers. And so that's why we really need to deal with this now. Let's see if we have any questions for the, from the audience. There's one right there. Thank you. Uh, I'm Rachel. I'm a, a freelance writer, and I love travel and um, have also worked in like humanitarian settings. So I have a kind of a twofold question for uh, for both Matt and the uh, and Travelers uh, Org. I'm um, I'm wondering how your respective companies and organizations are plan working together to plan for the needs of travelers with delivery of you know either emergency items or. Uh, like defib defibrillators or things that are simply just not um, maybe left behind. Um, and how that, you know, in terms of a service to travelers and creating great experiences, how you're, you're planning on working with these new ways of reaching travelers and how travelers are going to be traveling. So I, I think your, your question is basically, how do, how do you get that new technology to the end user? And probably seamlessly, let's that. So the tech, Flirty is building an on-demand drone delivery service that enables uh, delivery drones to deliver what you want when you want it. So uh, imagine, imagine a traveler checks in at the hotel and a uh, forgotten item of clothing. Uh, we're building a future where they can push a button on their phone and have that delivered to them on demand. Um, imagine they need cash. Why should they have to go to an ATM if a delivery drone can deliver the cash that they need when they want it? Um, and the logical extension of this then it ultimately becomes a society where uh, if you have on demand of what you want when you want it, the need for ownership decreases because we can have like a peer-to-peer -peer based sharing economy where you can, uh, uh, where society as a whole can be more efficient and needs can be met more rapidly. Charlie, I, I, I want to ask you very quickly, I, we've gotten to air traffic control, it seems to be one, a big priority, and airport crowding seems to be another priority. From the perspective of the consumer, are these one and the same? Do they, do they require the same solution or do we have to prioritize? Uh, not necessarily. I think that we need to prioritize. Um, and, and we've got different solutions for different problems. And the actual infrastructure problem is very different than the air traffic control issue. So uh, those are two separate issues. And going back to development and integration of new technologies, uh, we've been involved um, in new technologies such as scanners at airports when people come into the country. It used to be that uh, we found out that there were up to four hours of wait time at Customs and Border Protection stations in the United States, especially in New York and in Miami. And we went to the um, uh, Customs and Border Protection people and talked with them. And it was not only, and this was a, a situation where airlines, airports, uh, national uh, U.S. travel, and everybody involved in travel got together and went in and met with these people. And now we've got new technologies such as Global Entry, which has come in, which handles a lot of people, 
Um, we can move people more quickly through TSA lines now by using uh, pre-check. Uh, plus, we've got the um, new kiosks in different areas. So we've, we're already introducing a lot of new technology, which was very innovative five years ago, and now it's everybody's seeing it. And as a, as a visa holder, I have to thank you for making those lines quicker. But sadly, we are out of time. I would love to go on for hours with you. But uh, please thank our, uh, our panel. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today. Uh, as we now approach the final segment of this morning's program, uh, please settle in and give your full attention. We're at the, at the final stretch here, the final leg, if you will. Join me in welcoming on stage Congressman Rick Larson. A Democrat from Washington, Congressman Larson was first elected to the House in the year 2000. He currently serves as chairman of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, Subcommittee on Aviation. Joining the Congressman on stage is The Hill's Editor-in-Chief, Bob Chusack. Bob, take it away. Thank you both. Hold your applause. That's where it's <laughs> uh, please clap. Um, no. uh, Congressman, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Peter. Um, I, I first want to ask you a little news of the day and, and talk about the I word. It's not uh, infrastructure. <laughs> Impeachment is a process that now is undergoing. What is the mood of House Democrats right now for this really historic process? Uh, well, I think when it comes to impeachment, uh, no one should be celebrating um, if you're a Democrat. No one should be celebrating if you're a Republican uh, or if you're an American. It's a somber um, issue. Um, I think folks are t taking it very seriously on the on the three co oversight committees uh, as well. And I would note, though, that a very interesting thing. I think I've told you backstage um, the week that the Speaker Green lighted the inquiry. Um, that week here in D.C., I had 19 separate meetings with people from the district who are here visiting um, school districts and so on, things like that. Uh, I had two oversight hearings on armed services committee that were classified to find out what the bad guys in the world are doing, and I had an oversight hearing on FAA. Not once did impeachment come up um, here, and then I went home that week, and uh, I was at the University of Washington Husky game, and all anyone wanted to talk about was impeachment. Um, and by the middle of that week, I was ready to come back to D.C. where no one was talking about impeachment, um, honestly. Um, at home, it really is, uh, it's one of many issues, but it certainly is an additional issue folks back home are talking about, and I think most folks are hearing that as well. Uh, you've worked on uh, bipartisan legislation. Aviation usually is bipartisan. Yeah. Um, but in this environment, can anything, let's talk, you know, between now at the end of the year, do you think anything can get done, one of the big issues that's being discussed is USMCA. Can mm -hmm. that be done during impeachment? Yeah, I think what's really uh, interesting is that it is true, it's a cliche, of course, uh, that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. I think we can walk and chew gum, uh, pat our heads and rub our belly all at the same time in Congress, and we do that every day. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the, the USMCA is one of those issues where uh, the progress continues. The speaker has said she's still working to get to yes, and we have a, a working group made up of nine members uh, working with the Ambassador Lighthizer and his team to move forward on four specific issues, and, and we are. We are, are, are moving forward. I don't, I don't want to put a timeline on anything. It's, I tell folks there's human time and there's Congress time, um, and then they'll, never meet, they'll never match. Mm -hmm. They'll never meet up. But if you give Congress enough time on this, I, I, I do think we'll get to a, a point of yes. And, so it does happen. It, it, uh, as, as difficult as this issue of impeachment is, there is plenty of other stuff going on. Uh, a while back, uh, Senator Schumer, the Speaker, and the President agreed on a $2 trillion comprehensive transportation bill. Haven't seen that yet. Uh, are we going to see any movement? At least let's talk about the House. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is, is your committee going to be moving a bill? Well, I think the, the committee chair, uh, Pete DeFazio, would like to move a bill. Um, obviously, the financing part is out of our hands. The policy part is in our hands. But uh, infrastructure is in interesting. It's, it's really the only piece of legislation that we actually is, is paid for. Um, it's not a, usually. You know, right? It's not a, a deficit-driven uh, thing. Uh, there's a gas tax. When, when we're talking roads, bridges, highways, there's a gas tax that goes... Um, uh, with an infrastructure bill mm -hmm. uh, that pays for that infrastructure. So um, when we talk about whatever number, 
two right. trillion or whatever. Uh, the idea is we want to actually pay for that because that's how we deal with infrastructure. So you can make the argument that it's deficit neutral um, because we will end up, we will p find a way to, way to pay for it. There's a lot of positives to doing a, a broad infrastructure bill. Obviously, um, uh, the need is there. Um, in cl it's clear in my state, uh, $190 billion, uh, according to the Association of Washington Business in my state, $190 billion of, of need in infrastructure writ large, including airport infrastructure. Um, and then just think about it, you got 49 other, 49 other states and, and, other, and territories to think about as well. So that money going into the economy puts people to work. Um, so you're addressing infrastructure needs, you're putting, uh, keeping people working in what usually are really well-paid jobs. And uh, that money then circulates back into the local economy. So there's a lot of positives if we can get something done. Uh, you're the chairman of the Aviation Subcommittee. What, what's on the agenda? So I started out the year with four specific goals. Uh, uh, the first is, when it comes to aviation, the first is safety. Um, uh, the second was to look at the, how to keep the U.S. competitive uh, in a global um, aviation economy. Uh, third was innovation, and sort of the, uh, the theme of today's talk, uh, uh, the innovation in the, air, in, the, in the airspace. And then finally, uh, um, looking at the customer experience and how to improve, uh, improve the plight of the traveler. And so those have been the four main issues that we've focused on. As an example, the last, uh, the last one next month, we'll be doing a roundtable uh, with the industry folks and disability rights folks to look at the experience that folks with disabilities have from curb to gate to plane and back to the curb again to try to figure out ways to ensure that that experience for people with disabilities who are traveling have the same experience that I get to, you know, I take for granted uh, as, a, as an able-bodied traveler. So just as an example. In, in your district, there are many people who work for Boeing. Yeah. Uh, and the, the headlines, of course, have been recently about the, the Boeing 737 MAX controversy. Mm -hmm. How has Boeing dealt with this, and how has uh, the FAA dealt with this? Yeah. So it may not be known. I, I represent more Boeing employees than any uh, member of Congress, about 23,000 uh, men and women uh, who live in my district uh, go to work at the Boeing facility in Everett, Washington. Um, and then of that number, some of those are retirees as well. Those folks, a lot of them are married, a lot of them are kids. I mean, this, Boeing is very big in my district, the men and women there. And uh, so I, I think if I were to say, say anything um, to start, one is these men and women are extremely proud of the product that they design, assemble, and build. This particular plane is actually built in Renton, not in my district, uh, which is Everett, has the wide body plant, but they're all very proud of the product that they build, and they're all very distraught that this product contributed to the deaths of 346 people as well. And to the victims and their families as well, um, we need to keep them in mind uh, as we're moving forward in this, uh, in this committee investigation. Um, how, how Boeing has handled it, I mean, there's a lot of folks who are, um, have their opinions about that, um, and a lot of it is a criticism of the public relations side of things. Um, we're, our responsibility on the committee, and the subcommittee, um, is really to look at whether or not um, Boeing and the FAA use the, the law that, they, that we have to allow the FAA to delegate authorities uh, and some of that certification process to, to manufacturers, in this case Boeing, whether that was used appropriately and if it was used to pro, you know, within the law, um, should we pull back, should we put some limits around, around that? And that's been the focus um, of the last, um, well, since March when we opened up the committee's investigation. So we're looking at that certification process, we're looking at the training, how the training got developed uh, for the MAX and, uh, and for MCAS, uh, which I think was mentioned earlier. Uh, and then how that training was communicated, not just to domestic airlines, but to airlines uh, not based in the US and, and the pilots that fly those airlines as well. Uh, so to really answer your question, I, I think uh, you know, our jury is still out when it comes to how did they do? How, do, you know, how are they doing? Um, that's the purpose of our investi committee investigation. What's the timeline for this investigation? Uh, well, um, we've had three oversight hearings in the subcommittee, and we have a full committee hearing next week, uh, Wednesday the 30th, I think it's, it's the 30th, whatever day that is, mm -hmm. um, maybe Thursday, but uh, where the Boeing CEO will be testifying. I think he's testifying to the Senate committee the day before as well. 
Um, the focus of that will largely be on the questions that I've outlined on certification and training and communication uh, inside Boeing uh, and the communication between Boeing and the FAA from Boeing's perspective. Uh, and we'll continue to dig that out. I think in the next week or so, we're expecting the first, uh, uh, the first investigation to be released on, Lion, on the Lion Air crash. And that'll, be, uh, that'll inform us uh, as well. And then probably sometime in March or April, the investigation, investigative report on the um, Ethiopian uh, crash will come out as well, which will, which will inform us. But I think, you know, when you look at uh, what the, our own National Transportation Safety Board has already recommended uh, in terms of certification, you look at the Joint Authorities Technical Review Committee, or what we call JADR, which is a committee that FAA uh, developed and appointed. And then you look at Boeing itself making its own changes to the safety organization. You look at those three data points, and I think we're clearly pointed towards some changes in the law um, on certification to uh, get some, you know, I think what most folks would say, get some more um, uh, uh, civilian or regulatory control over that. We'll open it up to questions in, in a couple minutes. Just a big, broad question, because you're involved in aviation policy every day. What's the future of aviation, next five to 10 years yeah. for, for consumers and everybody, stakeholders? Yeah, I, well, I think it's, it's pretty interesting, uh, actually, the next five to 10 years. Uh, in the past, maybe even five to 10 years ago, when you talked about new entrants, you talked about maybe new airlines coming into use the airspace. Today's new entrants, uh, you have to think about new users of the airspace. Uh, you think about air taxis, you think about UAS. Um, I know you discussed uh, commercial space, uh, which actually uh, is, a, is a new user of the airspace. Uh, you have to close down a lot of airspace when you launch these rockets. Um, uh, there, there's a hyperson or a supersonics as well. Sorry, I have my armed services hat on a second there. Uh, supersonic uh, travel as well. So new entrance uh, means a whole different thing than it was uh, five to 10 years ago. And the FAA uh, itself needs to catch up to that. I, I think that if you look at the FAA's experience with drones, um, uh, it's fair to say, and they freely admit it, and I freely admit it as well, as the, as a, the, the overseer, the legislator oversight uh, of, on FAA, is that the technology got well ahead of our ability to find the right regulatory structure to ensure the safe use of that, that's now catching up. And I think the FAA is, uh, has learned some lessons from that, especially with the pilot projects that have been taking place in, in places around the country. And so that lesson about catching up with the technology and catching up with how new entrants are using the airspace, the FAA, I think, is learning that lesson, has learned some lessons there, and we're in a, in a much better position going forward to ensure that these new users are able to use the uh, airspace uh, safely. Uh, as far as uh, specifically on drones, what 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 do you think is the answer? Or what did what when you say what they learned? You know, yeah. going forward, this is this is a great innovation, yeah. but it's also can be dangerous. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I, uh, well, I don't want to overstate the danger part of it, but it is certainly um, it. They are uh, dr drones, and those who use them are new users. The the issue there's kind of two issues. One is there are a lot more drone users than there are people flying airplanes. Um, therefore, there are a lot more drones uh, in the airspace. And so um, having a way to identify um, those, uh, those users is important, um, keeping them accountable. And uh, that's why the remote ID rule is uh, important, an important priority of our committee to push the FAA to get done. Um, uh, that's, so that's, that's one difference, a lot more drone users. Uh, second is uh, drone use actually uh, can facilitate uh, economic um, uh, growth as mm -hmm. well. Sure. And so it really does have an important uh, role to play uh, in the economy. And so the FAA needs to, I think, gra um, grasp that, own that a little bit um, uh, as well. Uh, I think they uh, had a third, uh, a third issue with regard to drones as well that will, that will come to me. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, we have got a couple minutes left. Uh, if, if you have a question for the congressman, please raise your hand and identify yourself. And we'll have someone staff come around with a microphone because we're live streaming. <laughs> Hi, good morning. My name is Courtney Rose and I'm a reporter at Bloomberg Government. Um, you talked about Boeing's presence in your district. How do you balance your constituency's involvement with Boeing with your oversight responsibilities yeah. as aviation subcommittee chair? Easiest question and easiest answer in the world. Uh, the priority is safety. Um, if 
people don't feel comfortable flying on airplanes and they don't feel safe flying on airplanes, uh, they won't fly. And if they don't fly, there's no reason for airlines to buy airplanes. And if you don't buy airplanes, there's no reason to build them. And if you don't build them, then you don't need the jobs. The foundation of all of that, again, goes back to the first thing I said, it's safety. People have to feel safe when they fly. And that is the um, foundation of the subcommittee's work and the foundation of my work. So a successful aviation economy really does depend first and foremost on people uh, feeling safe about flying. And if they, if they don't feel safe, none of it, none of it else matters. And uh, so it's, it's a very easy balance. In fact, it's not a balance at all. It's, it's actually one-sided towards safety. I, uh, just to follow up on that, as, as far as where we've come on, on safety over mm -hmm. the last 10, you've been in Congress a couple decades. Mm -hmm. How Obviously, there, there have been some tragedies we've talked mm -hmm. about. It. Um, but how far have we come over the last 10, 20 years? Uh, we actually uh, still have the safest aviation system we've had ever. Um, and there have been uh, these two very tragic uh, uh, accidents uh, where 346 people have died, and we have to certainly be serious about that. Still, um, uh, air travel is a very, very, very safe way to travel, but I think we're learning as well, uh, it can always be safer. And I, th and I think the future of aviation is, um, is going to be, it will be more innovative. Um, I think it will be greener. We didn't talk about the work uh, we're doing on, on trying to green up the uh, um, airport operations or, or even air travel. Um, I think it will be more accessible, um, but it will be safer as well, and it has to be. Mm -hmm. We've run out of time. Please thank the congressman for joining us. I'll hand it back to, to Peter to close us up. Thank you, Congressman Larson. Thank you, Bob. And to all of our speakers, and thank you to our guests for joining us. That brings us to the end. On behalf of The Hill and our partner, Delta Airlines, thank you so much for being here. Um, for those of you who've missed any portion of the discussion, you will find the video on thehill.com shortly. And we encourage you to keep the conversation going on social media with the hashtag The Hill Aviation. As a reminder, for those of you in the room, please fill out those electronic surveys. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much and enjoy the day. Thank you.